we hold on to these suitcases full of things because we're told we must, then when it's time, and it was time for my mother, she no longer had any concern about who I was with or was not with. She would always ask me, are you happy, sugar? You happy? Welcome to the Zami Nobla National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for Black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. We have something very special for you on this Mother's Day weekend. Here is an interview with Erica Huggins, human rights activist, former Black Panther Party leader, educator, public speaker, and so much more. I visited Erica at her home in Oakland earlier this year, and we talked about a number of things. She was very generous in her conversation and provided a wealth of information about her life, her mother, being a mother, mindfulness, how we move in the world, how we identify in the world, and what a difference all of that makes. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation, and if you put your heart into it, you're going to get something out of it. I like to think of it as a revolutionary Dharma talk couched in an oral history. Without further ado, My name is Erica Huggins, and I found out that there are other Erica Huggins as well. So I am Erica Cosette Huggins. Um, And how do I show up in the world? Um, That's a very beautiful question. It's not about what I have accomplished so much as how I am becoming. Like every day, I feel new again, because it is a new day. So I show up with this feeling of curiosity and wonder that children have. Huh, what's this day about? That's how I show up. Well, I am so glad that you allowed me to show up with you today for the Zami Nobla podcast and to interview you here um, at your home in Oakland, California. I want to begin the conversation by talking about where you grew up. Um, I grew up in Southeast Washington, D.C., and I say it like that because Southeast gives those people who understand Washington, D.C., a sense of where it was. And when I was growing up in Southeast, all of D.C., as far as we were concerned, was called Chocolate City. Not so anymore. Mm -hmm. However, by the time I got through middle school and into high school, I knew that I didn't want to stay in D.C. for the rest of my life. I don't know how I knew it. I just knew it. And I had the great good fortune of attending the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom when I was 15. And that day, I made a vow, or a vow arose in me. It was more like that. It was very organic, um, that I would serve people for the rest of my life. And it, it was a pivotal point in my life to see all of these Black people and brown people and white people all gathered there in my city. And they had come from everywhere, on foot, in buses, in pickup trucks, and Greyhound and Trailways buses and church cars in their finest clothing and farmers in their coveralls. And I was so touched by the unified vision that I felt that day. I called it unity, but that was how I felt, that people were there for on purpose and with a purpose. And from that day forward, I wanted to serve black people, and all people actually, and I wanted to be a teacher of children. My first boyfriend had 
a brother who was suffering with a a degenerative illness, which also had within it uh, the retrogression of his body and physical ability and his cognitive abilities. An interesting illness. So though he was a teenager, he was a baby. Not in size, but in ability. And his parents put him in a um, a state home for children so that they could take care of his older brother and go to work and so on. And I went with my boyfriend at the time to visit that place and saw just the horror of putting all kinds of children with all kinds of abilities in one location without specific it was a state school. It wasn't the fault of the people who worked there. It was set up that way. Regardless of the of the ability and the needs, and I don't believe that anybody was physically harmed. I don't know. But what I saw was uh, not what you would see. I knew it was not what you would see in a wealthy home for children with, hmm. with needs like those. Eventually... Uh, my boyfriend's mother felt the same way about the place and took her child out and took care of him for the rest of his life. He didn't live a full life. But I knew in that moment at that place that I wanted to serve children for whom access was denied. I, I'm saying that now. Those are not my words when I was 16. Mm-hmm. But it's like all the children who nobody cared about is what it felt like right, to me. Right. So I wanted a school where every single child could be seen and heard and understood and more importantly, loved. So I decided to become a teacher. I went to two historical black, they used to be called colleges in a row, Cheney State Teachers College outside of Philly. And then that was a party school. So I left and went to Lincoln University and stayed there through my junior year. And I was one of the first 15 mm. women at Lincoln University. It was an all-male African-American school. And boy, was I naive. I thought because it was all African-American people and all black young men, mm-hmm. that it would be a wonderful experience for me. But there were not, not students, but there were faculty and some other people there who were not appreciative of women coming to Lincoln. And I was one of the first 15. Now, what you should know, and the reason why I'm telling you this story, is that I've been a first in so many places in my life. I don't know why. Mm. But it's always helped me to grow. Kind of like the Nautilus, that within its shell, Mm -hmm. they do not leave behind the past of their lives and live only in the moment. They're bringing the past with them. And moving forward with all of the past with them into the future. And so that was a really big awareness for me to have as a junior at Lincoln University, that it isn't just race and ethnicity. It's also gender. And I also recognized that sex early on, that sexual orientation was a part of all this marginalization, as it was called then. And so I began to grow within asking questions to myself and to others about why is it this way? I could tell by the time I got to Lincoln that the same conditions of poverty outside of that university in a place called Lincoln Village was so similar to the poverty in Baltimore, Maryland, which I frequented often, and Southeast Washington, and Northeast Washington, and parts of Northwest, if we're honest. And so what I came to understand is that we are all living with various identities. Mm -hmm. I'd already become a poet by this time, so what I'm trying to say is that my poetry reflected this big question, who am I? Who am I really? Am I just my my mother and father's firstborn, 
and daughter? Is there more? And I knew by that time, I knew when I was in uh, the sixth grade that I liked boys and girls equally, that I was aware of uh, my attraction to young men and young women. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know what to do with, with that because I didn't know anybody around me who had that same feeling. Did that maintain over the course of your lifespan to say that you were bisexual? You were bisexual or I'm, did I'm it one work? of those people and quite often people don't like people like me, but I have never been fond of labels. Mm -hmm. And whenever I use one, it's to presence the part of me that either has or does not have access. Mm. Equity mm -hmm. that is excluded. So I know I'm African American. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. It's it's you know. It's obvious, but in D.C. there were people who um, didn't want to acknowledge their blackness. So I did. I mean, I'd always been raised to do so. Mm -hmm. But when it came to sexuality, I was neither this or that. And if I felt this or that, I would have said it. And this annoys people. But I can only be who I am. I can't be something other than I am. Mm -hmm. And and I think there are people who do understand. And so I've that that's something I want to pause and unpack for a second. I have intentionally drawn to me people who understand over my life because it's been quite lonely to find people who understood the part of me that liked men and women, mm -hmm. that understood my desire for liberation and not just the physical thing we tend to call freedom, but an inner freedom. So I've surrounded myself with really amazing people because I sought them out. And they were this family of people that I have sought out over time, and not all of them are still living, have supported me, and I have supported them. And it didn't always include my family, mm -hmm. you know? So the family I was born into, I mean. Has it been difficult um, being so steeped, certainly in the civil rights movement and human rights, and being someone who understood your sexual identity to be so fluid, has it been difficult being able to stand in both of those spaces as who you are? Not after I recognized that if I didn't, it was unhealthy and it, it, it I didn't feel good. Mm. So that was that was probably in my between my graduation from high school and my first year of college. I started thinking, well, either I'm going to be who I am or I'm not. So there have been times where I had a boyfriend and a girlfriend, you know, in in one space and time. Mm -hmm. So I really had to not care. But what turned the tide for me, what really did it for me, is when I went, when I, when I was, and I'm fast forwarding in the story here, but when I was incarcerated, mm. I knew that if I wasn't going to be true to myself, there wasn't any purpose in living. I was already isolated from everyone I loved. And literally, in a part of that time, those two years, I was in solitary confinement. So I knew that my recognizing what my own truth is mm -hmm. was supremely important. And I could be stung by what other people said about who I say I am or how I live in the world, but I couldn't be sh pushed and shoved around by it for the sake of anything, and particularly not politics. I've always had a, a, a funny taste in my mouth about politics, not about revolution, not about transcending our um, notions of one another and our inability to reduce fear and move in a courageous way. I'm talking about 
the either or kind of politics, the way in which we um, say, well, I, I used to have friends that said, well, I'm, I'm declaring myself as uh, gay or lesbian because it's the political right thing to do. I'm like, what? How do you feel about that? Well, I'm not meant to have a feel. Yes, you are. So I believe in conversation that uh, keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. And the work I do now is facilitating conversations that matter about all kinds of things. So I think I'm being a, I think that when I was afraid, because I didn't have anyone to talk to as a high school student, I really didn't. That was not a conversation for my mother and father. And it wasn't a conversation for my sister and brother who were younger than me because I wanted them to have their own experience of their own lives. Were you ever able to have a conversation with your parents? Later? Uh, later. My father died before I could. He, he died at an age I want to call young. He died at 75 mm -hmm. of cancer. But at that time, in 1985, he would have been considered elder. But now 75 is not as old as we thought of then. Mm -hmm. And then my mother, um, I tried to tell her, and she thought, because of her uh, Christian upbringing, that I would burn in hell. So I couldn't talk to her about it. Mm -hmm. I could talk to my mother about anything, but except that. Mm -hmm. And that was a um, a tender place in my heart for many years. But you know what? Toward the end of her life, she had a stroke. It wasn't a painful stroke, but it caused some um, slow but steady cognitive decline. And she couldn't remember any of those things she held. Isn't life amazing? It is. That we hold on to these suitcases full of things because we're told we must. Then when it's time, and it was time for my mother, she no longer had any concern about who I was with or was not with. She would always ask me, are you happy, sugar? You happy? She even, she, she could not remember, and this is a sweet story. Can I tell it to you? Please. She could not remember who Jesus Christ was at, toward the end. My mother was legally blind toward the end. Mm -hmm. She'd suffered with glaucoma and lost one eye, and then she lost vision in the other eye. So I had to help her to see where her food is on the plate. Because I she couldn't live with me, but I I worked really hard to make sure she was in a small and comfortable place where she'd be cared from. Not not a huge gigantic nursing home. It took every penny I had and and lots of pennies from family to do this. But anyway, one day I was there with her showing her her dinner. And I was there almost every day. And this particular day, she said, Sugar, what are all the, I can see some lights everywhere. Not all of them, but there's a big tree. I could feel it over in the corner. What's the big tree with all the lights on it? And people are talking about gifts. And Christmas, what is that? This is my mother, who was raised Pentecostal and then missionary Baptist. But she had no short-term memory, although she never forgot the three of her children. But she had no long-term memory anymore. I learned so much from her, Angela, mm -hmm. in this, uh, the human mind and the temporariness of this life. So I said, well, Jesus was a great man who she wanted to know who he was. And, how, and where did he tend bar? That was, her, that was her way of asking, who is this <laughs> person? Where did he tend bar? And um, she was raised in North Carolina on a tobacco farm, the oldest daughter of 11 children. Mm. She couldn't understand what was all the, all of this, rushing around and doing. I said, well, he was a good man. And he lived his whole life 
so that people could understand the love in their hearts, not just for themselves, but for each other. And so this day, Christmas, uh, comes from two words. It was like originally um, a mass, a, a ritual for Christ. I said, Mama, I don't know how much people really do understand what, that when he walked on the earth, he did so, so barefoot and not in, not in fancy robes. And he had people with him that served his, his way of being and served his mission, but it wasn't for money or profit or to big, build big places for people to worship. And, oh, my mother had gone to Bible college, so she used to remember every single thing in the Bible. She didn't know. She said, did he do that? I said, yeah. And I didn't want to tell her how he'd been killed mm. because I wanted her to think of him alive mm -hmm. and walking. And I said, and he just loved everybody. And he's revered all over the world. She said, really? Is that so, sugar? And I said, yeah. So that's what, why they're, they're celebrating him. Um, it's kind of like his birthday, and, um, and people give gifts to remind themselves of the gifts that he gave when he lived. She said, hi, well, I guess it's good that we're celebrating this Christmas. And I go, yeah. And when I was driving home from being with her that day, I thought, there's so much credence put to having a, a lucid, brilliant, educated mind. And my mother's simplicity was so beautiful. It was wonderful to reflect on this with her. Because I talked to her not as if she were a child, mm -hmm. but she was curious and she was wondering, and that's how children are. That's how she was with me when I was a child because I had a million questions. When, How's the moon stay in the sky? What if the sun falls down? You know, just so much to the point that she would say, Erica, that's enough questions for the day, sugar. You can ask me some questions tomorrow. Okay, mama's tired. <laughs> so then when the roles shifted e easily and easefully, I wanted to really answer her question rather than be upset with her for not having an answer. Wow, that's, thank you for sharing that. That's oh, you're a welcome. beautiful My My mother story. was such a teacher for me from the day I was born until she died. And she still is. Mm. She still is. But um, yeah, I mean, all these, just like all these social constructs, race, gender, sexual orientation, class, mm, ability, all of them are made up. Every single one of them are made up. In some old paradigm that we have the choice now to pay attention to or not. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why labels bother me, because I was living in a box of labels. So why would I want to jump out of one box of labels and then tack on another one? But I don't have any problem saying that I'm lesbian. But I remember a time when people said to me, well, are you going to come out publicly? For who? Why would I? For who? For who? However, if there are young women and girls, particularly young women and girls, who are questioning their sexuality and they want to talk to me, I am way open. Mm -hmm. But just for the sake of making somebody's ego feel good, I don't get it. I think of uh, the piece that Audre Lorde wrote where she talked about, and I'm paraphrasing this because I don't remember it verbatim, but the idea that she wrote things that she needed to hear or mm -hmm. would have liked to have heard when she was younger. Gotcha. And I think about if I had a lot more information when I was a younger woman, I may have made some different choices or I may not have. Mm -hmm. But I think there's something pretty incredible about being 
visible in the world. And I have made myself visible. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of someone else, I couldn't do it. Mm. For my friends, no problem. Mm -hmm. I, I was one of the first girls to be sexual in my little posse of girls in D.C. <laughs> and they literally, when I would talk to them, they'd go, Erica? It was like the, oh, Erica month. Oh, Erica, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. They said, don't get pregnant. So I figured out another way. Um, so it wasn't like I was secretive. Mm -hmm. It was just, it didn't ring true. But I think it was also Audre Lorde who said something, I don't remember the quote, about bringing all of who you are to the table. Yes. And I have always walked into rooms and when time, I've said to whoever need, who needed to hear it, who I, all the pieces of me. And there's so many things that I am that once I start declaring, it would become boring, you know? Well, is that, I'm curious because I'm wondering, is that clarity something you had when you were a younger woman and engaged in the Black Panthers and in, yeah. this, in this space where- oh, I was big time lesbians and gay people in the Black Panther Party. I have a friend who did, a young friend, who did his doctoral dissertation on LGBTQIA and more, mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. people in the civil rights and the black liberation movements. And I was one of the first people he interviewed. Oh, we thought we were going to die in the morning. Mm -hmm. We did not care who, who we were loving. That was not a priority to care about it in the, in the way of politics. But the and there were people in the Black Panther Party who sheltered their sexuality. I guess that's okay. I can't speak for others. Mm -hmm. I, I practice non-judging -judge, awareness as best I can, and I hope I don't sound like I'm judging anybody else. But I don't, I don't want to be pushed to do something that I don't understand. I don't understand its purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in the river of memories, I think about how I was taught about civil rights and black people pursuing human rights. The story about LGBT people in the movement wasn't written in that way. And so now we're beginning to hear different stories. That's right. And my friend Ronald Porter did his doctoral dissertation at UC Berkeley, African-American gay man. And this was in the mid 2000s, somewhere around 2010 or like. I was so happy he was doing that. Mm -hmm. And we had some some really hilarious conversations about, and some really sorrowful conversations about how people held themselves in check. That that is so painful and unhealthy. And we don't want to be unhealthy. That's why I'm saying that when people reach out to me and they're questioning, how do I talk to my parents or how do I? And that mm. still goes on. It's, it hasn't changed completely, if we're honest, um, because the generations now and uh, are more honest than we ever were about all the things that they are. But still, there are people, especially women of, and girls of color who don't, who are afraid not to tell somebody, but afraid to be, to be, period. And I, I think you might know this, but I'm going to say it, that young people who are questioning their sexuality are the most likely, and, and with no one to talk to, and no model they can see, and I hear you about models. But what I was about to say is that the highest rates of suicide are among young people feeling that they're alone, that they're not quite right, that something's broken. This is in the 21st century. 
Yeah, I think I think where where I got pushed back was from adult lesbian women who needed to say, and Erica Huggins said, and this one and that one said, and that's the part I couldn't get. Mm, trying to frame you as the... Yeah, it's already been framed. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you know, you talk about the young people who... Um, are are still afraid of coming out. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I experience and I know is, is true is older women who are afraid of, of being out. And so with Zami Nobla, one of the things that we're really key on is creating space uh, for community and for women to have uh, opportunities of doing that. Because you may or you may not, you know, believe the number of women who are just afraid of coming out into space, uh, of being free and clear as mm-hmm. you present yourself and are. Uh, and there's a sense of sorrow for me in that, a woman who is 60, 70, 80, who's really unable to claim that space of freedom and clarity for herself. That's right. Um, and it and it has its roots in um, so much has its roots in the horrors of a, of the system that we call U.S. chattel slavery. We couldn't even be black. There was no identification, man or woman. We weren't fully human. We couldn't even worship not just our own traditional African religions, but we couldn't even, some slave, some enslaved people were allowed to read only the Bible. But you couldn't be taught to read a regular book. Mm-hmm. You, couldn't, you couldn't keep your own children with you. You couldn't have your own husband or wife or partner with you. Because you could be sold this way or that. So then once, after slavery was ended on paper, slavery didn't end. We know that. Mm -hmm. And in Jim Crow, where was the space for the black gay woman in the Jim Crow United States? Not just the South. We have this idea that racism is mostly embedded in the South. Not true. So where was the space Because the church by that time had become a haven for black people Mm -hmm. to participate in, in some ways, the American dream. It's kind of ironic because it was a place where you were free. The black church was a place where you were free to worship in the way that you do, which wasn't just Western Christianity. There's... African in there everywhere, Mm -hmm. from what I can remember in Mm -hmm. the church that I grew up in. But you had to fit, again, you had to fit into some kind of box. And if you didn't, it was said it was against the Bible. And I remember hunting in the Bible to see where that was. It's not really there. It's not really there in the way that preachers and and the reverends said it was. And my mother in the 1990s went to a church like that, where if I'd walked up and told the pastor that I was lesbian, which I wanted to do, to just see, have a discussion with him. Mm -hmm. And then I went to church with her. I visited her in D.C., went to church with her the following Sunday. And he was talking about, Men should be men and women should be women. And it went on. I'm not even going to go into Mm -hmm. what he said. And he was a young African-American man. I was able to tell him he might have been talking about people right in his church. Did he want them to be sad and feel not valued? What was the point? Right. And he had to think about it. But I had no idea. He was such a good person. I had no idea he would come like that in the pulpit, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
So after that, I, I wasn't surprised about, and I'm not surprised to hear that there are people who are still afraid because we have been raised in multi-generational fear. And that's why I said earlier to you that uh, freedom has been my, my lifelong mm, pursuit. But I really, I learned this in prison. It's an inside job. And I still don't know everything about freedom. I, it would be ridiculous to claim that I do. But one of the things I can be free from is what other people say about about me and how I show up in the world. There's nothing I can do about what... I can't do anything about it, so I may as well work to be free from it. Yes. Your period of incarceration uh, seemed to have uh, given you some space for some things to really emerge that now you are yeah. um, using in a very powerful way. Yeah, it's a conundrum, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That the place that had the most locks and bars on it of any other place in my life was the place through meditation once I began it and I chose to begin doing that. I can tell you a bit about why in a minute. Um, I, I felt absolutely free for the first time in my life when I sat still like that in that little cell in isolation. So um, there were five women arrested and six men arrested when we were arrested um, in New Haven, Connecticut for conspiracy with the intent to commit murder. And nobody who was arrested at that time had murdered anyone. Someone had been murdered, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't the group of us. It was a roundup. It was the 1960s, and the government was in fear of the Black Panther Party and created or enhanced its subset of the FBI, a clandestine subset of the FBI called the Counterintelligence Program, COINTELPRO. And so it was under the auspices of that that all of us were arrested. So the women went to the women's prison and were held there. It was the jail part of the women's prison. We were not allowed bail. The same is true for the men. And then there were minors, meaning they were under 18 years old. They were released because conspiracy means to breathe together. and There was no way they could pull those two women in. And then eventually there were five women, right? Um, the two other women were released, and there was just me. And they had held the five of us in a wing called an administrative segregation wing. It was a glorified solitary wing. But when there, was, there were six or seven rooms in that wing, they were cells, but they're not how you think of the concrete and steel cells of today's prison. It was an old, old building mm. with locked and barred rooms, tiny rooms. And so then the prison, without telling my lawyer, came to me one day and said, pack your stuff, Huggins. Um, I must have had a, a paper bag of stuff. Um, <laughs> State of Connecticut cannot afford to keep you in this wing by yourself. We're moving you to a solitary room. And somehow I got word to one of my lawyers. They hadn't told lawyers nothing. And they tried to change it so that I was in the regular inmate population, which we were trying to do the whole time for Mm -hmm. all of us when Mm -hmm. there were five of us. But our words, our very being was considered contraband. Mm. So I was in solitary, and then a couple of months later, um, after Angela Davis's lawyers had brought her solitary confinement at the Women's House of Detention in, Manda- in, in Manhattan, after her lawyers went to the state of New York, my lawyers and Bobby Seale's lawyers, I, I was on trial with him, co-founder of the Black Panther Party. We went to the state of Connecticut to say, this is solitary confinement? cruel and unusual punishment. And we were allowed out 
into the mainstream for Bobby men's population. I was allowed out into the mainstream women's population. I continued my practice of meditation, which I'd started in administrative segregation, and I meditate every day. Hmm. Why? Well, my original reason was that I could only see my baby daughter. She was three months old when I was arrested and um, confined without bail. And I just didn't know how to bear seeing her for one hour each Saturday. And I didn't want the energy of me weeping while I was with her to be with her. I just didn't want that for her. And so I asked one of my lawyers to get me a book about yoga, the physical postures, hatha yoga. And that little book had in it, and once you're finished doing these exercising postures, just sit still and breathe. Just sit a while. And almost immediately I started to recognize that I wasn't feeling so sad. That the grieving process from my baby's father, my husband, John Huggins, was still in place. But I could get some respite just by sitting and being very present in each moment. And then the other benefit was that when I did see my daughter after that, for the one hour each Saturday, I didn't cry the whole way through. I mm. cry all the way back to the cell, but she didn't see that. And then I noticed other things, that I was more resilient in the courtroom when we had to go. I was less concerned about things I had no control over. You see, I didn't know that I would ever be released from prison because I'd been told things from the day that I was arrested and during the trial that I would never see the light of day. So I had to come to terms with all of that at a very young age. I was 21 when I was arrested. So many people think meditation requires a guru, uh, a mat, the right clothes. And so finding that in that solitary confinement is pretty powerful and speaks to the accessibility of for everyone for everyone and it didn't and it did and the contrary to popular opinion <laughs> it didn't start in the west it's very african asian mm -hmm. but then it's been commodified here so that the clothing and the right kind of mat and the right kind of, is all connected to hatha yoga, which is one limb of yoga. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of even hatha yoga is to have a more grounded meditation, you know? And I think there is something to having a teacher if you need one, if you want one. I mean, we would never think to put a film together with having, without having somebody show us the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Artists all have mentors and sometimes teachers, writers as well. Um, well, you know, then that begs the question, who was your teacher? Well, I would rather just say that I'm a student of everything in my life, which is what that's how I'd like to leave it. Mm -hmm. And that's something I learned from my teachers. And, but I want to leave their privacy and the privacy of their students um, like that. One thing I do know with, for instance, statistics when I took it to... When I returned to school, because I left Lincoln University to join the Black Panther Party in my junior year, and I went back to school to finish my undergraduate degree, and then I went back to school again to get a master's, because it, I was um, teaching, and I wanted to be um, the best I could be in, in, in the work I was doing, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So... 
it was a sociology master's, and I had to take statistics, and and the and the message was statistics is not math. You're right. Yet yeah, is. <laughs> In addition, it's a whole different language. And co- you have to be in a certain cognitive space to understand it. I'm a I'm I'm I love poetry and I loved organ I love organized thinking and I love projects with detail, but statistics, I don't know what to do with that. But I had a great teacher. The first time I took his class, it was intro to statistics, and I made like an A. But in the one that was important for my master's, really, for research, I made a B plus. And all my buddies in that class said, girl, you got an A plus. If you got a B plus in his class, it was an A plus. But it was the way he taught. Mm. It was that he loved it so and it was first disconcerting. It's like, why does he love this? But then his love for it allowed him to answer our questions because we didn't love it. We didn't understand this new language. We didn't know what to do with it. But he made it as plain as he could. And I can't tell you how when I did enter research for my master's thesis, which was about race and gendered education, I was so grateful for that man's classes. And it was a lot of hard work. And when you have a teacher and you're really a student, it's always hard work. And the hard work for us right now is to look into our hearts. It's not statistics. It's not math. It's our own personal work. Look in there and see what's in there that gets in the way of us being of us being, of us presenting ourselves in a fully human way, and what's in the way of us allowing other people to be fully human. The state of the world depends on this work that each of us should do. Look at our earth. Look at the the world we're leaving for the babies being born now and the ones to come. Mm. Is that what we want? So you asked a question earlier about aging. I am so grateful that I have meditation and that I move my body. It doesn't move in such an agile way as it used to. However, I'm so grateful that I work with young people I can't get stuck. I can't complain about things like the traffic. I mean, it's, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm 72 years old. I'm alive. I'm not incarcerated. My children are all alive and well. My grandchildren give me the most inspiration. And I work with young people. And they make me laugh. And they make me hopeful. So I think aging is another construct. I mean, our bodies do age, mm-hmm. and then they mm-hmm. age out. Mm-hmm. But we knew that when we, when we got here, some kind of way. We knew we weren't going to stay little tiny babies forever. We knew that when we became children, we would become what we call teenagers, and the teenagers knew they'd become young adults, and then adults. So there's something that when I when my friends talk to me about all kinds of funny things like girl my knees are not right my back and I think about how the way we talk to ourselves I can give you my own example I can't talk about anybody else's example the way that we talk to ourselves promotes health or does not Does that fall in line with that whole mindfulness meditation thought? Yeah, mindful doesn't mean having a full mind. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in this room and I see Marlon Riggs' picture on the wall. And I see all kinds of beautiful things. 
a picture of the other Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm mindful of the room I'm in and you sitting there with your earphones and your beautiful silver bracelet. And I'm also mindful of me sitting here and there's a maple tree outside that wants to bud. And, you know, all these things are happening at once. And I'm allowing them to just happen and recognize my place in all of it. That this is where I am at this time. I'm mindful of that. So quite often we're rushing through the world and we don't see, okay, now I'm in this room with Angela. Okay. I'm not at my computer answering a long email thread like I was before I walked into this room. I can't be there. I have to be here. Mm -hmm. That's mindfulness. It's really simple. It's really simple. It's just making the space for you to settle in, to be where you are at a particular time with the people or persons you're with and, and doing the thing you need to be doing. And I learned that in prison. Um, and that's what helped me through the chaos of that courtroom. I can't even, there's no way I could describe it to you in a short time, but it was always chaotic. And I always knew that there were people holding the future of my life in their hands. But if, if I hadn't the practice of meditation, I would have been so distraught. So it's important, and I look at aging in that way. Like I know that, that I need to finish, I need to redo my will. Here's a concrete example. I haven't redone my will because I got very, very busy with all of this other stuff. And then someone so dear to me passed on in her sleep, in her late 60s. That's young. And it was in the process of grieving her transition, I realized I really need to finish doing what I had set about doing with my will and my papers and all of that real stuff that we need to do so that my children aren't burdened my grandchildren, my children are not burdened by um, my transition. Mm -hmm. They will grieve, but they won't be having to pick up pieces and make sense out of nonsense. Do you know what I mean? It's just I like, do. Yeah. And, you know, we haven't, we have had um, workshops at Jamie Noble to help women, in particular older black lesbians, create um, their wills, make a will. And so many people are hesitant to that because mm -hmm. I think that for them that means really facing death. We're going to die if we were born. Well, there are probably some immortals around that are keeping that to themselves, but <laughs> <laughs> perhaps <laughs> oh, I'm not joking. I mean, I have met some spectacular humans mm -hmm. in this life, but it's imp it, and it's important for us to take care of our business. Yes, because there are people who love us. They love us so. Yes, even if they get pissy with us and. Don't want to talk to us for a little while and, you know, all that. Still, I'm thinking, how do I want to leave this life? How do I want to leave it? Not just what do I want to do while I'm here, but how do I want to make that transition? And I saw my friend, and she's a meditation meditator. I saw her, the one I just mentioned to you mm -hmm. in the past. Mm-hmm. I went to her house and her practice of meditation, you could feel it in the house. And I went to her body, she was sleeping in her bed with her covers pulled up, with her earrings on the side table like she was going to get up the next morning. Her skin was so soft. There was no tension in her face. And as someone said to me, it sounds like she just slipped over. Mm. Or as my mother would put it, she just went on home. 
And where is that home? Mm -hmm. A disastrous, horrible, dark, yucky place? I don't think so. I don't know. But I don't think so. And I think we're, we're fearful of unknowns. But we're going to go. So we can make we can make our way just as if we were going on any other journey you know we would do some sorting and packing and planning mm-hmm. right correct correct yeah we we live in such perilous times and i'm sure we probably always have <laughs> maybe that's part of the human condition but mm-hmm. as we look at where we're where we are today in terms of just the the political atmosphere of our country and of the globe Uh, and people's lives are so chaotic and it's difficult for some people to settle down into the now and find that space of a freedom and clarity. What do you say to uh, someone who really wants to get into that space, but feel so burdened by all that's around I travel and speak for a living, and I facilitate conversations, as I said earlier. And I met a young man, and um, but well, a man in his forties, I mm-hmm. think, in um, Central Oregon. Wow, that had to be Bend, Oregon. That had to be one of the whitest places I've been in in a while. That's not, you know in the Midwest, and beautiful country. Oh, my God, so beautiful. But he told me in a conversation that we were having, not about Bend, Oregon, Mm -hmm. but about ancestors, he said that he got to meet both sets of grandparents when he was a little boy, and both of them had been, both sets of grandparents had been enslaved and freed. They were all in their 90s at this time. Mm. I was like so awestruck. I was like a little kid. You got to meet them and talk to them? He said, yes. And the thing about all of them is that they were so peaceful. And I, I keep thinking about that. When you've been through so much horror in your life and you don't have that horror anymore, you can just sit still. That's what I love about meditation. It's like all the things that I have been through in my life, it's seen me through. Now, it could be a belief in God or like my mother, a belief specifically in Jesus. Um, I don't know what this man's grandparents believed in, but he said he loved as a little boy just sitting with him. African-American lesbian women have those kinds of ancestors, whether we've met them or not. They paved a way for us. They knew we were coming, and they want the best for us. I really believe this with everything in my heart. They don't want us to suffer. And he said sometimes that they would look at him like they were so amazed by him. And he was just this little boy, the little black boy running around. But for people who bore children who were also assigned slave, um, This wasn't always true. So I think that cultivating gratitude, even if you can't do anything else. I have this little practice that someone told me. Think of, just think of three things you're grateful for. Every time I do it, I end up with like a million gajillion things. The list doesn't stop at three. Do you know what I'm saying, Angela? Can't you think of three real easily? And then don't you want to add and add and add and Mm -hmm. add? And I think that we get hung in the external 
stuff. But for those grandparents of my young friend, they really lived in some perilous times. Mm -hmm. Their very bodies they couldn't own. Their lives were under the control of something so big that it could build a whole economy. And so I think we have to put things in proper perspective and just cultivate gratitude. And and there may be people listening to this podcast who say, I don't have nothing to be grateful about. Well, okay, try one thing. Are you alive? Yeah, but I'm all alone. Okay, well, maybe make a space for somebody to enter your life. I don't know. But that's kind of how I think. Uh, If I feel lonely, then I make a space for something or someone. I don't don't know how to describe making a space. That sounds really um, la-la. I don't mean it like that. Mm -hmm. It's just I let go of those thoughts of being alone. I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm alone. And I might say to myself, I have all the people in my life that I need. And then sure enough, on the day that I say something like that to myself, I'll walk in Trader Joe's or some other public place and somebody will say, thank you for the work you have done. Now, to myself, I'm just Erica. I'm not walking around thinking about what I've done in my life. I'm just Erica, right? But it's always like that when you affirm your goodness, goodness comes. When you affirm your hard work, something will support you. Mm -hmm. And it may not necessarily come across as praise, but there's something. I I believe that um, we can have a loving and healthy life. So since I believe that, then I have to do things to constantly affirm it because my mind will kick up all kinds of things. And I was raised by an alcoholic father who beat my mother and us. And I could hang out in that. I refuse to though, because where's it going to take me? My father asked my forgiveness at the end of his life when he was dying of cancer and no longer could drink. But I remember that. My father asked my forgiveness. And by that time, I'd already forgiven him and told him so. And he goes, no, listen to me. Please forgive me. So I can go to the stories of how he was or I can go to that pivotal moment in my life that had to do with me making the effort to forgive him, and it was hard. And there are all these places in my life where forgiveness has been the antidote to suffering. That's my life. I'm not speaking for anybody else. And I watch my mind when it kicks up. Well, yeah, she was able to do blah, 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 but I can't do. Then Then I listen What are you saying to yourself, Erica? Mm -hmm. Are you saying that you don't deserve, that you're not worthy? What are you saying by putting down the good thing that you hear someone saying? And right now, the earth is calling on us to care for it. Someone said the other day that it it was two days ago. It was 70 degrees in the Antarctic. Right, I heard that. That's crazy town. Yeah, yeah. And it's us humans. We are responsible. Now, you and I didn't do all of this. Mm -hmm. But now that we know that it's happening, what will we do? So sometimes I just focus on what are the little plants and trees and flowers in in the garden near my house? What are they doing? Can I be helpful? Mm -hmm. You know, I appreciate the earth, and I try to walk lightly on the earth. There's so many little tiny everyday things that we can fill our minds with 
rather than the things that have brought us down and continue to bring us down. Because many of them we can't, we're not in control of. We're in control. We're shook in control of ourselves and our minds. So this sitting quietly, all it is is just sitting. You don't have to have, as we said earlier, a special clothes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't even have have to have a special posture if you can't do that. You can sit wherever you want to sit in a quiet place, wherever that is, in your room, your house, your apartment, your condo, or outside. And just notice your incoming and outgoing breath. Even if our breathing isn't what it used to be for reasons of of not as much health in our lungs, we can still sit quietly with ourselves and recognize the power that exists in each of us. That's what I recognized when I was in prison. There is nothing that could take that feeling of freedom from me without my permission. What a powerful conversation with you today. Thank you. It's been fun and touching to talk to you today. One of the the questions, Erica, I ask my guests before I close is, is there something we left out? Is there a memory? Is there a piece of information? Is there something you want to share with our listeners? Um, There's so many things, but one of them is to remember that We are immensely good. We are brilliant beyond measure. We are of supreme value on this earth, or we wouldn't be here. And we are full of love, and it is fine to share it. And that, like your audience, whenever this airs, Your audience and you and me are all connected. It's not an internet connection. It's not necessarily a physical connection. But we're all on the earth at the same time, bumbling around trying to figure it out. And that I hope that something we've shared today, you and I, will deepen that connection. Erica Huggins, thank you for connecting with us today and thank you for being part of our Black Lesbian history. Thank you. Thank you. Erica Huggins, thank you so much for that generous and timely conversation. When I interviewed Erica in February, I had no idea we would be where we currently are trying to navigate the coronavirus pandemic. Her words are so appropriate for these days. And this weekend of Mother's Day, so we are very grateful for her generous offering of time and wisdom. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did, and I look forward to you sharing the episode with friends and folks who will enjoy it as much as the two of us. As a way of supporting the work we do with the Zami Nobla podcast, it would be great if you wrote a review wherever you listen to this podcast, and if you found the link on our Facebook page, Add a comment. Let us know what you thought. Start some conversation. If you have any questions or you have an idea for an episode, feel free to contact us. Podcast at zaminobla.org. I hope you're doing well and that you're safe. And wherever you are now, whatever you're doing, may this day be a sweet one for you. And for those you love, see you next time.